Special greeting to any visitors this morning. We're glad you've come to worship us here at Southside. Um, the BBT, I wanted to make sure you, you heard that announcement, but my, my kids who went through BBT, this was, they're 31 all the way down to 20, one, two, um, three, wow. <laughs> Time flies. But they, they all just still talk about BBT and the way it impacted them and, and the power of, of the truth and, and the, the two young men who ran that and the way they modeled Jesus Christ to those kids. And so I just really encourage you to, to bring your kids for that. And then this uh, school meeting, I think, is going to be really important as we, our generation is changing so much and that we would have a place where our kids are trained in truth and righteousness and we're all coming together to, to be a team and a family to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So I encourage you greatly in those two things. Well, let me read to you Philippians chapter 1. If you'll turn to it, we're going to continue in our study there this morning. I'm going to start in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith." so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge we stand in your presence this morning by the work of Jesus Christ, and we stand in favor. God, sinners in rebellion against you for so many years stand in favor, and so we glory in Christ Jesus and we are grateful for this privilege to worship the living God. And we thank you that today we come to this verse that is just the essence of Christianity. God, I'm asking that you will work so specific and individual in each mind and heart this morning for what they need to come away with from this passage. For this is a life-changing passage. It is the, the heart and essence of Christianity so God, do your work in our hearts. I so desire that every one of us could join hands and say, for me to live is Christ. And I pray that we could declare and to die would be our gain. God, I'm tired of making earth our hope. This hope is to finish the race and be with Jesus Christ, which is very much better. God, let us quit clinging and holding so tightly to this world that's passing away. Give us the eyes of faith to run, looking to the author and perfecter of faith, Jesus Christ. Let us run to him. God, use this word this morning through the Apostle Paul by your Holy Spirit to create that in each one of our hearts. I have such a desire, God, that the, the remaining flesh that shies away from death that does everything possible to avoid it, that by your Holy Spirit and the realities of Jesus Christ, that that fear would be taken away from every believing soul here this morning. And I pray for every unbeliever, God, would they enter in to eternal life this, this morning. God, call and draw men, women, and children to yourself if they know you not. God, use this morning. Let it be a worship hour. Use it for your glory. Let the aroma of Jesus Christ fill Southside Bible Church this morning. We pray in that precious name. Amen. 
title for this chapter is The Fellowship of the Gospel. As I keep studying it and looking at it, the gospel is everything, and the gospel is what binds us together. In verses 3 through 8, we're to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another. We have koinonia in the gospel, and so I love you. We share Jesus Christ. We share this hope and this faith and the joy of the gospel. It bonds us from all walks of life, different races, different cultures, different uh, work ethics, all, all of these things that we come together, just one in Christ. We're to put the priority of the gospel at the center of our prayer life. We are to pray with this desire for Christ to be glorified and put on display, and that's by our life being changed and conformed to his image. And so we look at the needs that we have, and we pray according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we were to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your circumstances in verses 12 through 18, and Paul's in prison, and he's just rejoicing. The gospel is spreading. It's going to the whole praetorium guard. People are trying to cause me harm by preaching Jesus Christ to make my prison more difficult, harder, put the bolts in. And I don't care what then, whether in pretense or in truth, I just care that Jesus Christ is proclaimed. That's my love. I just let Jesus Christ be preached to the nations, to the people, to my neighbors, and to my own heart. And then in verses 19 through 26, last week we saw where to put the gospel at the center of your world and life view. We're to put the gospel at how we think about life and how we think about death. And so we are looking at the very essence of being a Christian. What do I do? I, I, I have this one shell, this one truth that is to anchor all that I am. And we will look at that verse this morning. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Father, I pray that you will open that verse up now. God, please teach us. Don't let us understand this with our head only. Let it get into our heads and go deeply into our hearts and our will. Meet us here this morning on this holy ground. God, I feel like we should take our shoes off for what we are going to look at. And I, I pray that you will meet us. Please put Christ on display to your people. Amen. This morning we open up, I think, one of the richest verses in the Bible. There's something so sweet about succinctness something I don't have. <laughs> uh, we love little catchy sayings that encompass a lot in them. We love the, the quotes that will, they just capture so much in a short phrase. And we have four Greek words that are all of Christianity and all of life and all of death in verse 21. It's as if you can take all of Paul's theology, all of his life, all of his eternity, everything to Paul, and you can come put it into this one verse. You, you take this committed Pharisee named Saul, and he hated Christ, and he rejected this fable of what he called the resurrection of our Savior. And he was in a fury to destroy anyone who had named the name of Jesus Christ. He wanted him imprisoned or put to death. There was a, a passion, a zeal, he said, against this name Jesus. And he's traveling on the road to Damascus to destroy anyone naming the name of Christ. And he sees the glory of Christ and gets knocked off his horse. And he realizes, I'm persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ. And now this man will travel 1,500 miles establishing churches all over this region to preach the name that he persecuted. And he's going to be beaten, mocked, ridiculed, scorned, stoned, imprisoned, hungry, and dangers from robbers, fears, all of these things because of this message of Jesus Christ. Why, Paul? Why would you do that? And the answer should have us on the edge of our seats. We get to hear from the Apostle Paul what drove this man. And it comes out in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Brothers and sisters, this is Christianity. To come short of this person is to come short of Christianity. And I come back to this illustration about every year from my own heart. I'm going to share it again. In October of 1967, the Soviet Union launched a space probe. <clears throat> it was designed to crash upon the surface of Venus and send back vital statistics about its surface temperature and the atmospheric pressures. The probe ceased transmitting at 3,774 miles 
from the center of the planet. And that was presumably, presumably because it struck the surface. And the information from the probe that was gathered suggested that there could be life then on Venus. But scientists have later determined that the radius of Venus was 3,759 miles, meaning the probe ceased transmitting when it was still 15 miles above the planet's surface. And so consequently, all of its figures were misleading. And in the same way, there are millions in our country who stop receiving data when they are miles from the heart of Christianity. Some stay in the outer atmosphere not wanting religion or God or the people in it because of their character. And they just happily stay out. Some stay out of the, uh, uh, some go into the atmosphere and they actually get into the organization called the church. And to them, Christianity is the visible church. It's just I show up at a church and that makes me a Christian. And so they're happy to just come and enter into that part. Some can get as close to Christ as creeds, confessions, baptisms, doctrinal statements. They, they'll, they'll get close. Some will come in and serve the needy and serve the least of these. But I tell you this morning, Christianity is a person. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And until by faith you are joined to him, you're 15 miles from the planet. You're, out, you're in outer space. All of what you do is misleading until you come and be joined to Jesus Christ. And so you can sit and be on the outside and come in here and do all of these things and never get to the core and essence of Christianity. And Christ says, come to me. Come all the way to me. Don't stop short. Or you'll all your, everything you'll get out of life will be misleading. I offer, come all the way. You'll never get to the core and heart You'll, be able to, you'll never be able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This verse is, is birthed out of being joined to Christ and abiding in him as a vine. Until this happens, you'll never have Philippians 1.21. You can put it up on your mirror and you can quote it every day and it will not have anything to do with your life. Without hitting the surface, for me to live will be rules, just my moralism, my conservatism. For me to live will be to memorize verses, to have potlucks, to keep my kids busy and entertained for a Sunday. For me to live is to have perfect doctrine. It will never get to the true surface of Christianity. The burden of my heart is that many are dying 15 miles from Christ sitting in our churches. And I know there'll be some sitting here this morning. I pray that we would come mind the verse this morning and all the fruit and that we would come all the way to Jesus. So let's take up this verse and get some fight in you this morning to say that I must make this verse my verse. I want this to be on every tombstone. I've teased my wife forever to put this on my tombstone. And I don't want it just on my tombstone. I want it in my heart. I want this to be inscribed right here. And I pray that for every one of you. So let's come. We, last week we, we took a look at verses 19 through 26. And we see that Paul's sitting there in prison. And he's waiting to hear whether they're going to cut his head off or not. And then we, he brings us in to say, what are you thinking, Paul? And he says, here's what I'm thinking. They're, they're, they're what's called instrumentals in the Greek. I don't care what instrument you pick, God, whether it's life or death, you pick. The burden of my heart is that I don't put Christ to shame, that I glorify and exalt him in my body, whichever instrument that you pick, God. If you pick life, I want to exalt Christ. And if you pick death, it's going to be gain because I'll get more of this sweet Christ. So the burden of my heart is not which one you pick. And I told you, I would have been begging God, not death. I want life. And Paul's just like, pick, Lord. 
I just want you exalted. Christianity brings us to that place, you're untouchable. So all week I'm like, I want that. How do you get there? Well, it's, it's 121. There is a way for every believer to get there by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at the first part. We're going to simple outline this morning for me to live as Christ. And the second point, to die is gain. I spent hours coming up with that outline. <laughs> if God is to grant me life, it's very simple for Paul. It'll be lived for Christ. It'll be lived in Christ, through Christ, and to Christ. I can't think of existence apart from anything else. For my life has been hidden with Christ. As Greg read, I've been crucified with Christ. I have died in him. I've been engrafted into Christ. Paul was not 15 miles out. He lived into the nearness and the fellowship and the communion with Jesus Christ. What came out of him, the holiness from Paul's life, was the fruit of the nearness of his relationship to Jesus Christ. When he wrote Philippians 1.9, this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in the real knowledge. This, what we're looking at this morning is real knowledge and all discernment so that you, your life can approve the things that are excellent in order that you'll be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Oh, it comes through Christ. Philippians 1.21 will never be yours apart from abiding in Christ. When I live in fellowship and drink up that sufficiency, my whole life just can think of Christ. My life is for him. That is the fullness of where it will come from. So let's try to figure out what Paul meant by this statement. I wanted to start with how contrasting this statement is with the world. As I look out at the scenery of our cosmos, these are the things that I hear. For me to live is my sexuality. For me to live is Epicurean. It's for, for pleasure. My life is how I can find pleasure. For me to live is a stoic. It's to be strong and in control and, and never let anyone see you sweat. For me to live is to be a good person, to be self-righteous. I hate the idea of grace. I can merit it through my own works. For me to live is my family, my friends, my career, my children, my job, my vacations. That's what life is to me. And so quickly you see the Christian is set apart from the thinking of this world and what it loves and has at the core of their being. What we once lived for, we have died to. Galatians 2.20. I, I, I like that illustration of I had an umbilical cord that was attached to this world. I loved it. I lived for it. I got my sustenance from it. And God took it out and he put that umbilical cord into Jesus Christ. And now my life is to flow through this sweet one, the Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, he's imprisoned. He's chained up. His enemies are trying to make life harder out of jealousy and rivalry and selfish ambition. If his life was his ministry, he is undone. But it was Christ, and Christ was still being preached, and Paul could say, I rejoice. And last week, if I get life, it will be fruitful labor and service on the faith of others that they would glory in Christ Jesus. Give me life. Christ is everything. I am going to labor for your faith that you find your joy in Christ. I just want him magnified. And if I live, I'm going to proclaim Christ so that you will glory and exalt by the progress and the faith and joy. That is what is life to me. So you look at Christ, you look at the cross, you look at his righteousness with the eyes of faith. And it just takes up your heart. And you are no longer your own. You have been bought with a great price. My life is now Christ to serve his people. That they would see more of Christ in his glory and it would shine forth. And that unbelievers would come to see this glory. That is life to me. It's so simple for Paul. It's, just, it's such a single-mindedness. 
It's Christ and him being conformed to, in his people, being formed in his people. I do not know, uh, I do know just a little bit of this desire, but it, it's just such a small flame. I've been asking all week, God, throw, throw some gasoline on my heart. May he throw it on every heart this morning as we come to the table and we look our eyes out again at Christ. And so on my heart, when Paul began this letter, grace and peace to you, church at Philippi, that's not dear John. We need grace from God to see Christ this way and the peace that comes in this gospel. God, would you give us all that grace for me to live as Christ? And as I was thinking and studying this week, I think there's even more to this. It might open up a little, a little more. To die is gain. And so I'm looking in this letter, Paul, help me understand what you're talking about. So we saw last week the immediate context, it's, it's to bear fruit. But if you'll flip over to Philippians chapter 3, <laughs> we got this die, uh, gain, loss, same kind of thought going on in Philippians 3, and I think it might help us understand more what Paul means by this statement. So look with me, let's go to Philippians 3.3. 3. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God, and what do we do? We glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. And then he gives us kind of the hall of flesh, uh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. So if you want to boast in your flesh, Paul's going to show you, I blew you away, uh, and I'll tell you what it did for me. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day. I was an eight-dayer. I was of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to law, a Pharisee. And as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. And as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever things were gain to me. So all of my religion and my seeking righteousness to get God's favor and his approval, all those things were gain to me. And now I have counted them as loss. And the Greek word is manure for the sake of Christ. So now here's, here's what life is for Paul. It was once pursuing after the law and good works and trying to get favor from God. And now that's dead. I, I, I just, that was all leading me away from Christ. All my morality and religion I thought was getting me closer and it got me further away from God. And so I count those things as lost. And in verse nine, I just want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So for me to live it's to no longer labor in my flesh for the approval of God. It's to live and to enter into this, this righteousness that comes by faith in Christ Jesus. I, I live into this daily, that I'm accepted and I'm loved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not my own. So my life is the righteousness of Christ. And then in verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost. In what? in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I might gain Christ. For me to live is everything in this world has become rubbish compared to the surpassing glory and value of what I've seen in Christ Jesus. My life is that Christ is that diamond and treasure hidden in a field. Knowing Christ is better than anything else in this life is what Paul is saying. And when we live into that, he's going to be exalted by our bodies. And so I pray that you see this. If I get more life, it's Christ. And I'm going to treasure and value him more than anything else in this world or in this life. Take away the things of the world. And this is the, our struggle with circumstances this morning. Christ is my true treasure. And I make him look great and valuable to this world when I show them he's better 
than anything this world has to offer to me. And this brings Paul joy. And so I spent much of the week alone with God, and I want you to do the same thing this week. What is life to you? And I I don't want the Sunday school answer, I want the real answer. What is life to you, truly? If you take away something in this life from me, am I done because that's what life was to me? Or can I say before God, for me to live is Christ? And I've sat with some of you who have lost spouses and moms and dads and all of your riches and health, and I've watched you say, I glory in Christ. That's for me to live as Christ. I'm going to live a life in this world that prefers, treasures, and seeks Christ above everything else. The just shall live by faith. In the midst of a world that seeks to build a life on anything but that, I'm going to gather every week to come worship with God's people. I'm going to get in a midweek. I'm going to get to Sunday school, whatever it takes to help people, to help me keep Christ in that place. That's why we gather. Keep Christ in that place. We exalt Christ through our bodies together. That's why you put Christ at the center of your fellowship. That's why you pray for the fruit of excellence excellence to bring glory to God. That's why you just care that every circumstance in your life is used to put him on display. And that is why if God gives you more life, it's for Christ. Have you chosen something lesser to live for? And, And I ask that you answer that with judgment day honesty. Have you chosen something else to be your North Star? It won't bring joy. It will bring sorrow, despair, pain, anger, disappointment, whatever your idol is, it, it won't serve you well. And so if, if, you're, if you're battling and God's crushing your idol, he's asking you to lift your eyes to Christ and say, that's what needs to be the center of my life and my heart. For me to live is Christ, amen? amen. And to die is gain, point number two. That's an amazing statement to me. The gospel can bring a man, woman, or child to this place. I've sat with too many of you who you're like, I just want to die and be with Christ. I like it. I'm always trying to reel you back instead of push you. I know there's some of you saying, I'm just scared to death to die. But a bunch of you, I just, you got to stay. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta stay God determines when and I love I love that I gotta reel you back because what you're you know what you're telling me to die is very much better and I, I love it that's the life of faith it's available to every believer in Jesus Christ this morning I think it's the essence of our faith I, I, I honestly don't think you can say for me to live as Christ until you can say to die is gain. I think it was uh, Billy Graham. He said, until you're prepared to die, you're not prepared to live. And so what must be settled in every heart is this gospel, to die is gain. Just right now before God, to die is gain for the child of God. Paul is looking death right in the face. And as he looks at it, he, he logics. And he goes, man, it's, It's gain. It's very much better. Why is this so hard for us? Well, I was looking at Hebrews 2. Claire Lees and Austin and I were laboring in this verse a couple weeks ago. And it says in verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same. So Jesus took on flesh and blood that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. 
So through Jesus' death, the, the devil had this power, and, and he comes and he just renders him powerless. The devil had such a power over death because the sting of death was the law. And Christ came and he fulfilled the law and he died for all the consequences of our transgressions of it. So the devil now for believers, he lost any power over death. So I want you to look at death and the thing that's scary is the devil. And then, and I want you to look at it and say, he rendered him powerless. He's like the, the oh, I'm trying to think of his name, the humble bumble in uh, Rudolph. You remember that? He, he had these big teeth. And at the end, the, the, the Hermie pulled all his teeth out. And he came, and I was a little kid going, ah! and he smiled, and he had no teeth, and he said, he's nothing anymore. He's a humble bumble. That's what the devil is. To the believer, he's a humble bumble. He can bark, but he has lost the power. He's been rendered inoperative so we can stare death in the face by Jesus Christ and be like, Paul, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where's your sting? You got no power over me any longer because Christ went in it and conquered you. So death this morning, believer, is gain. Lose the fear. It's gain. It's Christ will come in the shadow of the valley of death and meet you and bring you to glory. Hallelujah. People are enslaved. It says that he came, uh, he might deliver those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. The, the unbeliever, all of their days, they're going to death. Woo, I can't hear you. And they're slaves, and they, there's no freedom because they know at the end of the day what's coming. It's God said it in their hearts. It's why there's world religions. And so they're, there's, it's a slavery. And, and, and so it, it, just, it just has them in bondage. But not you. It grips the unbeliever all of their days. They can't escape it. I like the illustration Two skydivers, they jump out of a plane, and you're looking at them going, look at their freedom. <sighs> I've always wanted to do that. But one has a parachute and one doesn't. Do you think their experiences will be different? I mean that. Because I, I look out in the world, and you guys don't make sense. Your experience is completely different. There's no fear of death. And I watch unbelievers, and I've watched them die. And I'm telling you, they don't have parachutes. And, and you'll be a slave to that drop your whole life. You'll just always have it in the back of your mind. No matter how much you eat, drink, seek pleasure, distract yourself, it's in the back of your mind. So the other, with his little parachute, is just going to enjoy the whole, the whole ride. <laughs> and that's the believer. I, to die is gain. So death is not natural. Romans 5.12, sin entered the world and death spread to all men. The dying process, I know, is resisted. It's not natural, but to die is gain. And so we come to a verse like this, and it seems paradoxical. To die is gain. People don't talk like that. The gospel riddle is only the Christian can understand this passage this morning. Because if we look only to the scene, it's not true. All, all we have is the earthly loss of our loved one. We have a widow in bed alone, an eye that lost sight, and a lip that can't speak, an ear that can't hear, and a feet that doesn't have motion, a body that is just a shell, and we have a hearse, and we have black clothes and dirges and mourning. How does Paul say such a thing? Paul's saying, I want you to come and put your eye up to the telescope of faith that goes beyond that picture. And what pierces through the veil to the unseen is we are brought back to the death of Christ. And it looks like it's not gain. I was thinking of Christ. They're, they're like, our leader's been crucified and he's laying in a tomb. The hope of Israel's gone. There's just death and darkness. And then up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He's, a, he's seated above all and he has conquered death and God raised him and said, it's finished. And then Paul stands up in Corinthians and says, this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So here it is. Here is the only way to be set free from the slavery of fear of death all of your days. I need you to look into the lens of faith at the one who conquered it. Why would Jesus Christ be dying on a tree if this wasn't the way he conquered it? If, if, if you could get righteous another way, then Christ died needlessly. The Father is satisfied. It's finished. And one day, one day those bodies like Christ will be raised imperishable and immortal. And so Paul cries out from his prison cell to die is gain, to die is gain, because I get Christ. What one thinks of death will drive all of your life. And I just want you to have that freedom this morning. I want you to be free from the fear of death only because of Jesus. Thomas Brooks said, a Christian gets more by death than he does by his life. Solomon said, the day of one's birth is better than the day of one's birth. We, when we got born, we were born into this fallen, howling wilderness. And when we die, we enter into the presence of Christ forever. So for Paul, death was gain. In verse 23, because he said, it's being with Christ. It's very much better. Death is not a dead end. Um, the, the word deliver, it's, it's taking the rope off the ship and letting it go to your eternal port. Paul says death is a departure. When you go to the airport, what do you see? Arrivals and departures. You leave here and you go there. And this Greek word meant unyoking animals from the shaft of the plow, laboring for the name of Jesus, and we're being released now to enter into his eternal rest. It's the loosening of the chains that held a prisoner. It's the loosening of the mooring ropes of a, of a ship and that we go to our eternal rest. So when I die, I depart, and it's my marriage day. It's, it's my best day. For Paul, life was union with Christ, and death, that would not be broken. It would only be enhanced. It would only be enhanced because my life to live is Christ, to die is gain. He's so narrow. <laughs> what is death to you, Paul? Oh, it's not strained breathing. It's not fighting. I don't, I don't think it was, he's picturing his head being cut off either. I think all Paul could think about is death is what brings me into the presence of Christ. Most commentators give a list of all the benefits that are gained. You, you, you say goodbye to friends and you join the souls of those made perfect. No more corruption, no more trials, no more temptations, no more tears, no more pain. And the list goes on and on. I just love that God has given us so much to show the excellencies of heaven and all the, the horrors of hell. And he gives us both. But that is not Paul's focus. He's not going to die as pearly gates and golden streets. He's just so narrow. It's one thing. It's Christ. I might not even notice the streets. My preoccupation in life is Christ. And my preoccupation in death is Christ. Paul was helplessly in love with Christ. So much so that even his dying is wrapped around the one person. I like that illustration that my friend Rick Anderson gives. He says, picture you're, you're in the Navy and you're, you're assigned to a port away from your new bride. And you spend several years in a ship in cramped corners. And you write these letters to your wife. And you, when those letters come, you just read them again and again. And you smell them, and they smell a little bit like her perfume. And, and you're just longing to be with her. And the orders finally come that say, you're going home. And you ask them, what are you, what are you going to do? Where are you going? I'm going to my wife. Well, well, wouldn't it be great? You'll have better hours finally. No, I'm going to my wife. Well, you'll, you'll get to go home and go to your favorite restaurants. I'm going to my wife. Uh, I'm going to my love. And that's anything you asked Paul. What is life? Uh, Christ. What is death? Christ. What is the law? I've been, I've been joined to Christ. What is marriage? To model and reflect Christ. Everything you asked Paul, it was just he had one string on his banjo. 
Christ. We are not in home port yet. We're in cramped corners of this world with long hours to labor for the name of Christ. And we read his letters and we see the beauty of his tender mercies and we wait for the commander to say, rise, come. And I can only think of my beloved. I want to go to Christ, my sin bearer, my surety, my savior, the mediator of a better covenant, the spilled blood, the guardian of my soul, the intercessor on my behalf, my friend. Samuel Rutherford, I think, put it best. If I were to die and go to heaven and there was no Christ, it would be hell to me. And if I were to die and go to hell and there was Christ, it would be heaven to me. The gates, the gold, the rest, all of those things will be nothing if Christ is not there. I pray for that. Socrates was in prison waiting to die unjustly and he was not a Christian. And he said, it's now time to depart for me to die, for you to live. But which of us is going to a better thing is uncertain to everyone except only to the deity. Paul said, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I should not be put to shame in anything, but that Christ would be exalted in my body. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. John Calvin said, my respiration is difficult and I'm about to breathe the last gasp happy to live and die in Jesus Christ, who is gained to all his children in life and in death. Paul's dilemma was Christ by faith or Christ by sight. And I desire the one that gives me more of him. Just simply the Apostle Paul in a nutshell. So as we close, I'm going to try to wrap this whole thing up and I'm going to give you as succinct of a statement as I can of Philippians 1.21, so we go home with kind of the essence. So to die is gain. It, it's, it's Christ. In 2020, I'll never forget that the, the pandemic hit, and I'm sitting in California, and I couldn't be with you that first Sunday. That was hard. Um, driving back, I, I drive through Las Vegas, and there's, there's not a car on the highway. That's never... I mean, there weren't any cars in California, highways. And it just was eerie. And I, I remember driving back and saying, God, give me wisdom. For we don't know what this is. Give me wisdom for how to shepherd the flock of God. And I see in this passage that he wants to, uh, to glorify God by life and bear fruit. And Christ has put it on display as great. But as I start studying, Philippians 1.21 is where he led my heart. And I'm asking this question that I think needs to be answered is how do you glorify God by a dead body? You know, I want to glorify God by life or by death. And I'm just sitting there going, okay, Paul's laying there dead. How does that glorify God? How does that exalt Christ? And so you get more of Christ. That's gain, but I can't see any of that. But the burden of Paul's heart is how do I put Christ on display? I don't want to be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, he'll be exalted by my body. And so a dead body will exalt Christ, I think, for why it's dead. So there is glory like it's dead because it loved Jesus Christ and would not let go. But I think there's just a little bit more for our hearts this morning. It's that I exalt Christ this way. As I approach death, as I walk to the guillotine, it's this. There is nothing that I'm leaving here on this earth that is better than Christ. There's nothing that I'm leaving that is better than where I'm going. And I've seen that, and it exalts Christ so beautifully. I'm about to lose everything on this earth. All of its delights and pleasures and relationships and sights and tastes. But none of it can compare to where I'm going. I'm going to Christ. There's nothing that I want to hold on to here. There are great things, and I have such deep friendships. But to die is very much better. I don't think I could love my wife anymore. No, I could. I could. I want to be with Christ. He's so much better and more delightful than a thousand, thousand worlds and all of its pleasures. 
At his hand, right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the only way I know how to exalt Christ in my dying. And here's how I finally got this from my head to my heart. I preached that when I came home. And, and after that, God took it from here to here. And I'm going to share with you how he did it. And it happened during covid after I preached that sermon, when I got back in Philippians 1.21, I'm driving home, and it's hard preaching to nobody. <laughs> Who's a sweet person that put faces up? So someone put pictures of all the faces where you normally sit, so it helped a little bit, but not much. Um, but I, I just remember, I'm driving home, and I call my dad, and, I'm, and he, we talk about Philippians 1.21, and I just wanted to share about it. My dad was raised in a family where his dad was a drunk, humiliated and embarrassed him at sporting events and things like that. His mom lost a child and had another, and that child became everything and really despised my dad. And he, he grew up alone and on his own. And all he ever wanted out of life was a wife and a family. And when he, when he passed, it was a few months before my, my mom's 65th anniversary. And she was everything to him. And he said, all I ever wanted out of life, and I don't know if he's lying or not, he said, I, I asked God for seven boys. Who does that? <laughs> I've had three. And I think I'd ask for seven daughters. <clears throat> Sorry, Jord. <laughs> um, but what I learned from my dad, he had no hobbies, really no friends, he worked harder than any man I've ever known. And whenever he was off, it was us. And we'd play football out back and basketball. I mean, it just, it was us. That was his life. And so if I had to say to my dad, he would say, for me to live is my family. He was raised Catholic. And by God's grace, one time, he and I began studying through the book of Romans. And, and he said to me, Kenneth, he said, I... I just basically love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. And I remember sitting in our car, and I said, Dad, is that, is that true? And I went over what that means. And next week, he came back, and I've never seen my dad cry, and tears are coming down his face. And he said, you've ruined my life, son. And he said, I've spent all week realizing that I have never loved God that way ever or my neighbor. And I said, oh, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And he got it. And I watched it break in. And I used to always say, if you died and stood before God, and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And he always said, I just hope my good deeds outweigh my bad. And I asked him after this, and he'd been reading Spurgeon. And he said, I, I just, I, my, what I'd say to him is my only hope is the righteousness and merit of Jesus Christ. COVID-121, driving home, it just all broke in. And he's like, to die is gain. And he just, he, I, I couldn't, he just was oozing. And he just, he just talked the whole drive home of this, this, what God did in his heart. He saw the glory of Christ in a big way. And I watched everything begin to change. And he had a, a bunch of great grandbabies about to come into the world. And I'd say, Dad, aren't you excited for some more grandbabies? Yeah, but listen to what I'm learning about Jesus Christ. And he just wanted to talk about the Bible. And suddenly for me to live is Christ. And that Easter, I remember preaching 1 Corinthians 15 and just putting that battery on your shoulder saying, death, I, I stand and I mock you. you. Where's your victory? Where's your sting? And, and we, we came home and nobody could get together and for, on Easter and so we're Zooming or whatever it's called, Zooming. And all, all my brothers and the families and, and my family's kind of a, the, the ones who aren't saved like to just, you know, definitely mock and joke and all that. And everybody just kept joking on this thing. And my dad would be like, wait a minute, let's talk about what Kenny preached on this morning. And he just kept bringing it and, and we'd go off and he'd go like, no, let's talk about to die's gain. And it, you just, you couldn't move him away from it. And then his heart began to give out and we had put him in hospice and I sat by his bed and it was so amazing because all he could talk to me about was his joy of going to be with Jesus Christ. He loved his family even more because he finally could love it rightly, not as an idol. But we were eclipsed by something better and brighter. I could not hold that man back. I think my mom was frustrated because he wasn't fighting. 
But all he wanted was Christ. And he was running to him. And on that hospice bed, he kept staring at this corner, smiling. And I'd be like, what are you smiling at? <laughs> and he, he just would keep looking there and smiling. And no one's in the corner, nothing. And, and when I went home, I got a phone call that he passed. And I drove back over, and he was just smiling, staring in that corner. And the, the good shepherd just came and took him home. So what he did for this old guy, the man that I got a mentor in the gospel, now mentored me in childlike faith. He taught me how to glorify God in death. He made Jesus look better than anything that he was leaving behind. I got eclipsed and I loved it. To God be the glory. So my summary is for me to live as Christ. That in life, I'm more satisfied with Christ than anything else in this world. And to die is gain. I'm more satisfied in Christ than anything I'm leaving. Do you see how married this is? Christ. If I get life, it's Christ. If I die, it's gain because it's Christ. Have any of you stopped 15 miles short of that? I pray, come all the way to Christ and let him take up your heart. And my heart is not my own, it's now Christ's. Let's pray and we'll go to the table. Wait, hold on one second. First, there's one last thing I gotta say and some of you aren't gonna like it. There's gonna be some of you sitting here this morning, I want you to hear this real clear. To die is not gain for everyone. For some, it is eternal loss. What you've held to instead of Christ will be taken away. And you'll go to home port, which is a risen judge who will judge the living and the dead and he'll cast you into the eternal lake that burns with fire forever. So my heart this morning is why would you be miserable in life and miserable in death when Christ has come into the world and asked you to come and be saved and to, to now have joy in life, not a perfect life, just joy now, and that to die will be gain for you for, forever. I, I ask that you would come to Jesus Christ and believe in him this morning and be saved. I think for the rest of the body, just have you drifted from this sweet truth? Has something, life, just the business of life, the riches are choking it out, the concerns of the world. There's so many things that squeeze in and as we come to the table, this is a time to restore your first love and to just look again and say, Christ, I, I'm just meandering this life and for me to live, if I'm honest, is not Christ. It's, it's something else. So I'm just asking before God this morning that you repent and you look again to Christ and say, I want you to be that in my heart. And he loves to just cleanse and bring near and bless you. So just, if God's worked that in your heart all week, I've just like, I feel like I've played with Christ for too many years. I want everything for this Christ. So I pray that at the table, as we look our eyes out, that every heart would be like, that's it. That's my, all of my life is Christ. And to die is going to be the most gain that you could ever have. So let's pray and we'll go to the cross. Father, thank you for these words. God, thank you for Paul just being able by the Holy Spirit to open up what, what drove him, who he was. And it's so remarkable to what he was, hating this name and now this name was life. He's been crucified with him, and, and now he lives by faith in the Son of God who loved him and gave himself for him. God, let that be true of every one of us in this room this morning. God, I pray that Christ would be gloried in by every heart, that we would put no confidence in the flesh. Our hope all is built on Christ. Our, our, our hope for our sins is the one who hung on Calvary's tree. 
God, we join together uh, shoulder to shoulder in faith and look again at the work of Christ. And I pray, just restore every heart to make him the center of all and everything. All of our distractions, all of the lesser things that have taken up our heart, God, let them fall off this morning. And let, oh, bright and glorious Christ shine into our minds and hearts. And it's in that precious, sweet name that we do pray. Amen.